All right, is this on? All right. So, thank you for being here. The last talk of the conference is always a dicey thing. So, um, thank you for staying. Hopefully, we'll make it worth your while. Uh, my name is Tom Disler. This is Arthur Davis. Uh, we work on the Solid Fire product at NetApp, and um, today we wanted to present a project we're working on. Um, it's around network configuration management for. Um, distributed systems for the data center. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about kind of some background, who we are and what SolidFire is, so you have some context. Um, we're on the platform team, so there is this division. There's a, the SolidFire application, which is a storage application. It's a scale out, share nothing um, uh, data center storage solution. and that is one team that works on that. The platform team provides the entire uh, environment that that executes in. So hardware qual, like it says, uh, we're using Linux, the, the OS, Zookeeper, drivers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're currently working on uh, improving network management and configuration. Um, some things to know about, to give you context about the problem we're trying to solve. Um, so first of all, it's a share nothing architecture, so it's not, if you're familiar with storage architectures, it's not a central controller with a bunch of <clears throat> uh, storage arrays behind it. It's basically rack and stack one, one U nodes where every node participates in hosting traffic. Every node has similar network config. Every node participates equally in serving volumes. Um, their primaries for some volumes and their backups for other ones. Um, and I'll show that a little bit in another slide. Um, Multi-tenancy is a big deal because we're in a lot of um, uh, not only data centers but um, uh, service provider environments where, those, where they will sell um, storage to customers on top of our system and they'll sell it at certain tiers and so we have a lot of QoS things we have to guarantee. Uh, we can't be making network changes, let's say for one customer adding a VLAN and have it disrupt traffic for other customers uh, on the same nodes. Um, that's where VLANs and Verse come in, because a lot of customers now are moving from their private local data centers up into the cloud, and they want to bring their IP space with them, and they don't want to re-IP everything, so we need Verse so they can have overlapping IP spaces. Um, high availability and reliability are really important. Um, you could imagine if a uh, a hard drive vendor got a reputation for every once in a while corrupting your data. Nobody would probably buy their stuff anymore and they go out of business. We can't lose data, we can't corrupt data. Um, some of the workloads that are, we're running are, you know, things like entire product databases, they're for banks, they're trying to run payroll on it, people get mad when they don't get their paychecks. So, uh, very, very important that we're reliable. Um, and there's just a link to a YouTube video if you want the one hour presentation on the entire, on how the architecture actually works. Um, this is just a node. And I wanted to just give you a sense of what our network can look like on all the nodes. Each node would have uh, a matching network config. Um, some of the physical interface names have been changed to protect the innocent, but we're just saying ETH0 through 3. Uh, we have four physical NICs on the back. We are running Ethernet, all our cluster traffic, like cluster to cluster traffic, TCP. We bond them together uh, in pairs, and we do, uh, there can be an optional VLAN on top for traffic, tra uh, traffic tagging. And then if there's one node in the cluster that's elected cluster master, and it may host what we call the MVIP, the management virtual IP, which is where if you're going to hit our REST API, hit the cluster uh, web page. That's where that, that IP is what's going to get hit. This is the storage and intercluster traffic side. So we separate management because management doesn't usually, so the ma people who manage the cluster don't necessarily get access to the storage. All the storage clients can't manage the cluster, so just allows segmentation. Um, but this is really the part that, there's two parts that, that can change. One is we support up to 256 VLANs, which may or may not um, be in their own network namespaces. Um, and these change as new customers are added. Um, they may cr they'll create a VLAN for the customer and then put all their volumes in it. And so, boom, another VLAN appears off here. When a node is elected cluster master, 
every VLAN has to get its own version of what we call the SVIP, which is the storage virtual IP. These are VSVIPs, VLAN virtual storage IPs. Um, but these are basically be become the iSCSI targets for if you're familiar with SCSI. Um, so we can't have this VLAN come up and disrupt traffic on this VLAN. It just can't happen. And a lot of network, the network managers we've surveyed and we've played with and used in the past, sometimes you go change one thing over here and they'll tear the whole thing down and build the entire, the bond and everything back up. Um, even sometimes for simple things like changing the MTU, you have to go restart the networking service. Um, I have no idea why they do this, but must be just completely different use cases. Uh, but we can't do that. So that's kind of a picture, um, an overlay maybe, to give you some context. So right now, and this is pretty typical of any distributed system I've worked in for multiple companies, the network configuration becomes, is built into the application, the distributed application. And what needs, what really needs to happen is it needs to be pulled out because they're two completely separate problem domains. Distributed systems is like a whole specialty and problem domain in and of itself. If you've ever worked in them, um, they're a whole beast in and of themselves. And so for like at Solid Fire, we have our architecture, and then a few years ago we did like TLA plus analysis on it to go, if you're familiar with, um, uh, was it temporal logic analysis, to go try and prove out our failover algorithms and other things. And then you want the code to match the architecture and the model to match the code. There's this nice triad. But then when you go to try and make it a product, you end up with network management and drive management and all these other things that kind of gum, can gum up the code. And it, it, from an architectural perspective, you really want to pull all that network management stuff out. Because um, the application itself really only cares about, is something wrong? Can I connect? You know, did the network get partitioned? Much higher level things. Can I still communicate with things? Was I allowed uh, elected cluster master? So pulling this out, um, is really important for us. That's what we're working on now. We haven't really found something that does what we need, and I'll go through some of these. Uh, but if you guys know of something, please tell us. Then we don't have to write it. Um, but we haven't found it yet. So uh, a couple things. Um, when the node boots up, this thing needs to start early and create the bonds for us, set the IPs, put it in LACP mode or whatever bonding mode we have, things like that. Um, we need an application interface to it. Uh, so shelling out to bash, running bash scripts, or doing exec, or doing other things like that, are much more error prone in our experience, and we really want some sort of like programmatic API that we can um, interact with. We also need uh, notifications back. So when we lose link, for instance, we need to know, or the application needs to know. When there's a config mismatch, or someone in support, or an engineer fat finger or something on the command line, we need to know there was a problem um, uh, for various reasons. We have cluster faults and different things. Um, we support multiple concurrent actors acting on the network. So we have this problem today where we, d we have two processes that sometimes you can have the user trying to add a VLAN through the API at the same time that node gets elected cluster master, and now two processes are making network changes, and we need a way to serialize it through so that we're doing one set of changes and, and the config moves in a very consistent manner forward. Uh, so that's where these transaction semantics come in. Talk a little bit more, more about that later. Um, monitoring for network changes. Uh, right now we have a bunch of monitoring code built in to the app. The app really only cares about reacting to events. So when something goes wrong, that's built into the architecture that we lost connection to Cluster Master, or we are Cluster Master, there's a problem, we need to call a new election. Those are distributed system problems. That's the app's problem. The app doesn't want to sit and have to interact with Netlink. It doesn't make sense. It's an, it's an architectural problem that I, I don't think is good architecture. Um, and a best effort attempt to repair things, fat finger things on the command line. Um, when things go wrong, there's a certain set of interfaces. We need that, that daemon to just sit there and keep trying to put the, net, um, the network config in that state. So. Um, so I've talked about design patterns. This is a lot just kind of compare and contrast what I was saying before about the application problems and the network uh, management solution problems. And they're really two separate problems. And to really be able to scale and 
maintain your code. It makes it much easier if you can just split these two. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything on here I actually want to point out. A lot of it I did say. So, um, so Arthur here is, is going to describe the design of the demon we're building. Um, I really wanted to go over some of the motivations, um, like I've already been doing, but non-destructive network changes um, are a big one, and there are some places where we can handle it, where it would be okay, we could explain it to customers, it'd be fine, but the kernel provides this network stack and the ability to make changes in so many places without being disruptive, and we're using good network hardware, and the drivers support it, why would we not build and have a network management solution that takes advantage of that and just artificially make it disruptive because we couldn't design our manager very well. So that's one. Um, transaction semantics and asset guarantees. That's just for the configuration itself. Um, we, can't, we can't take a block of changes and with the current kernel interfaces make the, give asset guarantees on changing the system. But on the config, we can. So if we our elected cluster master, and we need to go create 200 uh, virtual interfaces, we want those to succeed and fail in a block as far as applying them to the config. So it, because if we don't want the, the config to show half the interfaces were created and the other half never got created, or, or especially if we crashed in the middle, when we come back up, the config we read needs to be some, the last known good state um, or if we're changing routes and we're trying to change two routes and one of them got changed but the other one didn't, all these kind of problems we can't have it either. All need, the config needs to, this block of config changes needs to happen or fail and needs to be durable and, and always move from one consistent state to the next. Uh, recovery, if the daemon crashes, needs to replay its log or it get back to its last known config. Hopefully the if we write our client library right, the application won't know. It'll just know that maybe it failed to apply the latest config and got some error back until the daemon came back up. Um, we also need to know if the system crashes, that config, any part of the persistent config has to be consistent, um, which is part of that ACID guarantee of durability, the D on there. Um, scope management, uh, this is something that's really important to me. It's very much if we're told to manage a set of interfaces, we manage those and those only. And if you have Docker running and we have containers on the node and other things, and they're creating bridges and other things, don't touch those. That's not your domain. Like, leave those alone. It's not your business. And if those come over into our side, we're just going to keep trying to repair it and end up fighting it. But like, there's this domain and this scope. Like, this is what you're dealing with. Just touch that. Don't try and take over the whole system, um, things like that. And then supportability, that's more around logging and stuff. So that's all I had. Arthur's going to talk about the design. Which one? That's, the, yeah, that's the next one. So <clears throat> I wanted to just remember back to the title of the talk, which was about increasing reliability, um, which, uh, well, so for us, the main point with the um, increasing reliability is about the, these application concerns versus configuration concerns mm -hmm. and um, allowing us to ha write applications that focus just on doing what an a or implementing the product behaviors for what the application how you know how is the network supposed to be behave on this or how is this product supposed to be used on the network and what sort of things should happen um, in the case of certain network faults or events and that sort of thing. So um, what I'm going to do is just really kind of a high-level overview of uh, the solution that we're moving forwards with, mainly because we did, we spent quite a bit of time actually surveying things that were available from the community. In fact, that's where we started this project, was to go find the open source project uh, or even a commercial project um, product that would, would work for us. And we kept looking for something and just never really found the thing that hit the mark for us. And so that's what brought us here. We certainly didn't start out 
build your own, um, which I think is never a good place to start um, without at least looking around. So the, for us, and Tom, let's see if I can find the right slide. So this is a sort of a small, silly little diagram, but um, it hi highlights this application logic versus network configuration logic. And in, in our solution, this network configuration piece is just exposing the kernel interfaces, the kernel configuration interfaces. And so there's no logic that would allow us to, or that where this would say, tell me when we can get to the internet, or something that's higher level that requires putting together several pieces and imposing some specific behaviors, or looking for some specific behaviors. And so this is really a low level solution. Um, this data model concept is really just what sort of data are we working with, and it is exactly the data that you would see, the organization of data that you would see in the kernel interfaces. So if you go and you look and you see addresses, you see firewall IP tables or NF tables or um, route tables, and so the organization here would be exactly what you would see from the kernel. There's no attempt to add any extra abstractions or to uh, do any other sort of fancy modeling uh, to bundle these up into something um, different than what the kernel provides. Um, when a client wants to make some changes through this little daemon to reconfigure the network, they will fetch some portion of this database, rearrange or make some changes to it, and then tell the daemon, here's some diffs and or some changes that I want you to make based on that thing that I just read. Um, internally, we have this same sort of data model. Um, um, it's versioned, and that's an important piece to uh, the, the concurrent actors uh, solution. The, the um, one way to explain that, I guess, is by an example. If two clients read the database, they both make or compute some deltas that they want to apply, then <coughs> they both come, one will come first, and it will apply its changes. Those will presumably succeed. The next one will come and try to apply those same changes and will be refused because you're trying to change something that is based on an old view of the network uh, or of the configuration. So um, internally we'll have objects. Those objects are that, that represent each one of the the, the configurable entity, so like um, a route or a route table or an interface, uh, and that for us is a place to put just logic with respect to how do you manage the configuration, how do you talk to the kernel for this particular type of object. Um, some of these things have different interfaces, and so those um, contain that logic. Uh, they also deal with uh, some other things like verification and um, validation that I'll get to in a minute. Um, so this I wanted to just, it's, it's a really kind of a, a, a really high level course picture. Um, I'll just highlight three pieces and I, then I have a slide for each of the three pieces. Um, this side here is all about talking, these we call them sources and I'll get to that. This middle section um, is kind of the, the heart of the system. It's the logic for dealing with the configuration and, and synchronizing the system with what the con client expects it to look like. And then this last bit, this last bit is um, the, the monitoring and the repair logic that Tom alluded to or referred to earlier. Um, so this, I won't come back to this, uh, but it, we have so these three slides that will kind of touch on each piece. Um, <clears throat> sources for us is a way to decouple the internal logic from how do you want to talk, you know, what sort of language do you want to talk with the client. It could be, uh, for us, JSON is kind of ubiquitous through our system, and so that's kind of our natural first start, step. But you could imagine other things. Um, we've 
Dbus in the context of network configuration seems to always come up and people ask, internally ask us about that uh, or we've asked ourselves about that if that's the right thing for us to use and maybe for some sort of integrations or something. Um, but this notion of sources allows us to sort of say, okay, we'll, we have a place to put that um, when, when we need to do something besides just uh, the basic JSON. Um, yeah, so the sequential, that, that's the, really the other piece of the concurrent actors um, solution. Um, aside from the versioning, um, we just do one thing at a time. So, uh, and, and this is, these are config changes. And so when one config change comes in, we take care of it and we take care of it in, in its entirety and then we move on to the next one and so on. Uh, the socket source is really for us how you talk to the clients. This is the internal IPC communication. So everything in the system that is a configurator or an actor um, will come across this simple sort of Unix domain socket. Uh, it gives us some nice features. First of all, it highlights that it's internal only, so there's no like remote management capabilities. Um, and then also, it gives us some easy authorization solutions so that we can get the user group and then derive network namespace um, from each message that we, or each request that we get from various clients uh, on the system. Okay, so this I wanted to just walk through real quickly, um, a client request. So, and this is that whole heart of the, uh, the middle section from the earlier diagram. Um, so, a client request comes in and says, I want to change something, some configuration. Doesn't matter what it is. And so the, the, the first thing we'll do is we'll clone this internal database and we'll um, then give that to the source, that abstraction, and say, here, please apply your changes to this, this clone of the database. Um, once that's done, then we'll take that full clone and we'll validate it. And uh, there's um, there's two. I mean, so there's there's two kinds of validations. There's the syntactic validation, which says, you know, is everything in range, or did they pick some silly value that's just never going to apply to that the, the the kernel will just outright reject. But then there's more complicated, these semantic sort of inter-object um, validations uh, that allow us to say, for instance, they're trying to install some route and there's no interface to go to get to that, that next top router. Um, and so there's the, the main point of this validation phase uh, is to come out with high confidence that we will be able to apply this configuration change to the kernel. Um, and that'll make a little more sense as we move on. So the next thing, now that we have this high confidence that this configuration change is good, uh, then we deal with writing it to files, uh, we save our internal state and we log maybe, you know, f f like a, a journal type change log so that we can see, you know, just one after the other what sort of changes the, the client made um, or all the clients together made. Uh, and so then once we've written this information out and all of that has succeeded, uh, then we make this clone proposed configuration the active configuration. Uh, and that's when this version increments. And so anything beyond, before this step, ha, um, if, if something fails, we're able to just throw away this pr pr proposed change and um, the system is, is exactly the same way that it was, so it's unchanged. Um, it's once, and so this kind of gets back to that point that Tom was making about these transactional guarantees that um, we make that to the configuration, not to the system state. And so at this point, once we've accepted that configuration, we've incremented the version, then we make this first pass attempt to modify the system. 
Um, and I say first pass because maybe there's something that takes time or we need, you know, some things need to settle and before all of the configuration changes can be made. Um, and that's where this next phase comes in. Um, notice, though, that if something fails, at this point, we're not failing the change. There's no, the, as far as the client's concerned, their change was successful. And now this daemon is responsible for making the system look in that state. And so then that's when this monitor and repair becomes, or comes into the picture. Um, and so it has the ability to look at things that didn't apply completely the first time uh, or that needed some more time to be able to successfully apply or maybe some software error or some other problem or even a user has logged onto the system and deleted something that the software, that the, you know, like the cluster master software has said, you know, it needs to be in this state. So the system will notice those problems, will detect that and um, well, first of all, generate a notification for these problems, and then secondly, um, attempt to put the configuration back. Um, and then if they do, you know, if it does successfully repair the configuration, then it can go and clear that notification, and the client is, you know, there was a little fault that popped up and went away, but that's okay, it's all better. Um, so that's kind of the walkthrough for this system that we're, that we're working on. Um, the reason that we're here, I guess we, I mean, so this, this is something that we, so I, I mentioned that we looked for um, a solution that did fit what we were trying, you know, fit our requirements, um, didn't exactly find it. There really are some good solutions out there, and there were some that were very close, and I'll definitely admit that. Um, but we felt like there was room for um, something that was more along what we like what we've described and so we do intend to share this with the community um, and we're eager to um, have feedback and to hear ideas this is a stupid idea this is great um, <laughs> or somewhere in between and different things to point out um, also you know to to work with the others as well so um, yeah, these other two bullets, I will. I'm pretty short, so I will, short on time, so I will just uh, skip those. But yeah, I mean, um, we do have a, a substantial investment in testing, and I'm really happy to have this project grow up in that environment. It'll get banged on pretty hard, and in addition to just the testing that Tom and I will do as part of as developers of the system, there's a substantial tests. Um, staff, infrastructure, environments, um, that it will also go through as part of being part of other products. So um, I think that's it. Yep. This is the end. Thank you. Any questions? No questions? Do you have a question? Oh, there's a question back there, Jamal. Hi. So um, to go back like two slides, I think this is very useful. And uh, you mentioned there are other systems like this, but they are not exactly like this. Can you like sort of summarize exactly what's unique about your solution and uh, what systems it differs from or looks most like? Yeah, to some degree. I purposefully came up here choosing not to name names and, <laughs> and throw darts. So, um, and, but like I said, there's some really good things out there and they were close. Um, the, the biggest problem that we kept coming across was finding too much stuff kind of bundled up into too much application specific logic bundled up into the configuration configuration system so um, there would be some extra assumptions that didn't apply to what we were trying to do um, Tom mentioned we've also had some problems with um, one system that we're using now that just likes to tear things down when you make a change um, so there yeah I mean there's a, a, a collection of 
different little issues that we, and, and in the end, I guess the main point for us was that we wanted to, something that really allowed us to focus on what we felt like were kind of best practices for application design and designing um, a robust, reliable system without having to work around um, some things that forced us kind of into a corner. Yeah, um, I think it got back to when I was trying in the beginning to say what we're building this thing and, and really the things we need. Some of some of the solutions are great and we need we need like some guarantees around the config moving from consistent state to consistent state. Or some solutions will get us where we want to go, but there's there's not an active monitoring solution and repair um, built into it that I don't think we found anything that really met if you forget even monitoring and repair, like let's assume we could build that on top of something else. Mm -hmm. um, it really got us the transaction stuff. Um, you did a lot more research on this kind of stuff, so I kind of leave it to you. But I, nothing came across as like checking all of those boxes that a lot of this we actually have today in the solid fire system and going to, I don't even know if we found a system that wouldn't be a regression for us as far as what network, like what we do in the solid fire product that we're trying to keep and pull out. Uh, it's kind of a fuzzy answer. I'm not giving specifics. I'm trying to avoid naming certain things. And well, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> that sounds great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Thank you. Thank you.